On May 22, 1960, southern Chile experienced the most powerful earthquake ever recorded. For over 10 minutes, the ground shook with unimaginable force, measuring 9.5 on the Richter scale. Just 15 minutes later, tsunami waves as tall as an eight-story building crashed into the coast. Two million people lost their homes, and the damage totaled $4.8 billion in today's currency. Force, which spread havoc around the entire rim of the Pacific Ocean. Thousands are dead, one quarter of the nation, over two million, homeless, and still the upheavals continue. Whole cities have been reduced to shambles. But how did that happen? It's May 21st, 1960. An 8.1 magnitude earthquake strikes Concepcion, Chile. 1960 quake, about 10 times greater than today's, shook Chile for 11 horrifying minutes and sent shockwaves around the world, triggering destructive tsunamis. 15 hours later, a 35-foot wave smashed into Hilo on the big island of Hawaii. As the dust settles, seismologists observe something far more ominous unusual seismic patterns indicating that this event might precede a much larger quake. The pattern was characterized by a series of strong aftershocks that suggested a significant release of energy was going to happen. Seismic Pacific Ring of Fire the east and the Pacific Ocean to the west. The frequent earthquakes and volcanic activity are caused by the convergence of the South American and Nazca plates. As Chile sits along the Pacific Ring of Fire, an area known for lots of earthquakes, the country stretches along a subduction zone where tectonic plates collide, building up enormous pressure over time. This pressure can lead to catastrophic releases of energy. In the hours following, the warning signs are unmistakable, persistent, strong aftershocks, and rising in frequency. These indicators all point to an imminent, massive release of energy. It turns out, this is only the beginning of a much bigger disaster. As May 22, 1960 approached, the ground begins to shake, softly at first, then with increasing intensity. Many residents reported feeling a prolonged shaking that seemed to last far longer than any previous earthquakes they had experienced. At 3.11 p.m. on May 22, 1960, the most powerful earthquake ever recorded unleashed its fury on southern Chile. In Lumaco, 570 kilometers south of Santiago, the ground heaves violently. Families cling to each other as their homes sway and crack. Trees whip back and forth like wind dancers. The rupture zone extended approximately 800 kilometers along Chile's coast, from Concepcion to Isla Chiloé. The town of Puerto Montt was devastated, for example, and the village of Tolton was almost completely reduced to rubble. About 145,000 homes were destroyed or damaged, but that wasn't the worst. Valdavia, the most affected city, experiences shaking beyond anything residents have ever known. Streets buckle and twist, buildings crumble like sandcastles. Half of the buildings in Valdavia were rendered uninhabitable, leaving approximately 20,000 people homeless. Landslides destroyed colonial Spanish forts in the city of Valdivia and dammed waterways throughout central Chile. Major flooding and disruptions in telecommunication services hampered rescue and recovery efforts. The whole country stretched during this earthquake, explains Sergio Barrientos, who directs the National Seismological Center at the University of Chile and experienced the quake firsthand back in 1960. The coast moved toward the west. That increased the area of the country itself. The Associated Press reported that recording needles in Buenos Aires, Argentina, jumped off the recording paper at the start of the quake so that scientists could not register the violence. 
Seismic waves from the main shock were recorded traveling around the globe, and the planet was evidently shifted slightly off its axis, shortening the length of the day by 1.26 microseconds. But the worst was far from over. As the shaking subsides, a new threat emerges. Coastal residents notice the water receding at an alarming rate. Those who recognize the signs scream warnings, urging people to higher ground. Just 15 minutes later, an 80-foot tsunami, the same height as the White House, followed. It would be a few more hours before the effects were felt around the rest of the world. About 800 kilometers, or 500 miles, off the coast from Concepcion to the south end of Isla Chiloe was impacted by the tsunami, and debris was carried as far as 3 kilometers, or 2 miles inland in some places. Across southern Chile, the tsunami caused huge loss of life, damage to poor infrastructure, and the loss of many small boats. For example, in Mei Huen, 150 boats, most of them used for fishing, are reported to have disappeared. Some kilometers north of Meihuen, at the coastal town of Keule, a carabinero reported hundreds of people dead or missing some days after the tsunami. You have a big enough earthquake, it releases enough energy to set the whole earth ringing almost like a bell, and it rang for days after the, the 1960 earthquake. Lucy the Jones of the U.S. Geological Survey explained in an interview with CBS in 2010, when you have a big enough earthquake, it releases enough energy to set the whole earth ringing. And that rang for days after the 1960 earthquake. The true scale of the disaster is still unfolding, and unbeknownst to those in Chile, the Pacific Ocean is now carrying a deadly secret across the globe, and coastal communities around the world have no idea what's coming. The earthquake's colossal energy release triggers massive waves that travel at several hundred kilometers per hour in the open ocean. Unlike wind-driven waves, tsunamis involve the movement of water from the surface to the ocean floor, allowing them to maintain their power over vast distances. In Hawaii, some 15 hours after the initial quake, a ship captain notices unusual wave patterns on the horizon the first sign of impending catastrophe. Fuseo Itu, who lived in Waiakea, a section of Hilo Bay, was awoken at 1.04 a.m. by the deafening roar as her house was brought down around her. According to the Pacific Tsunami Museum, by some miracle, she managed to survive and live to tell her tale until the age of 96. Fuseo was completely taken by surprise when there was a deafening roar as the 35-foot tsunami wave brought down her house around her. She was hit on the head and lost consciousness. Her next recollection was of coming to and finding herself swirling around in the bushes that lined the Waialoa River. Clinging to her screen door, she was washed up and down the river several times and then finally carried out into Hilo Bay amidst all the debris. Waves as high as a three-story building were recorded in Hilo Bay, Hawaii, damaging 500 buildings and businesses and killing 61. The estimated damage was $75 million. Almost a day after the earthquake hit Chile, it reached the Japanese island of Honshu. While the waves had shrunk to 18 feet, they were still deadly, destroying 1,600 homes and killing 138 people. The Philippines were also hit with 32 dead or missing, and along the Pacific coast of the U.S., the nearly 6-foot waves damaged boats at docks in Los Angeles, San Diego, and Long Beach. Adjusted for inflation, 
it is estimated that the whole ordeal cost up to 6.56 billion pounds. Scientists observed a tsunami maintaining such destructive power over such vast distances. As the waters finally receded, leaving behind a trail of devastation across the Pacific, the Earth stirred restlessly, ready to deliver one final, fiery surprise. After four decades peacefully slumbering, on 24 May, 38 hours after the main shock of the 1960 Valdivia earthquake, the eruption was believed to have been triggered by the earthquake. On June 4, 2011, a powerful volcanic eruption began in central Chile. A large explosion occurred, causing a 5-kilometer-wide planning column to shoot to a height of 10 kilometers or 33,000 feet above sea level. As the eruption energetically continued for several days, large quantities of ash drifted towards the east. The same tectonic forces that trigger massive quakes can awaken sleeping volcanoes. As the Earth's crust shifts and buckles, it creates pathways for magma to rise, creating conditions ripe for eruption. For the people of southern Chile, already devastated by the earthquake and tsunami, this new threat feels like a cruel twist of fate. Cordon Call Volcano is located in central Chile where it is 84 kilometers east of the city of Osorno. This volcano not only includes the stratovolcano which bears its name, but also a series of young vents to the northwest and the older Cordillera Nevada caldera. The eruption opens a 5.5 kilometer long fissure with 21 individual vents spewing lava and tephra into the air. Over the next 59 days, Cordon Calle produces approximately 0.25 cubic kilometers of material, enough to bury Manhattan under 30 meters of volcanic debris. Lava flows reshape the landscape, while ash falls like dark snow, blanketing the surrounding areas. Despite the significant volcanic activity, there were no reported human deaths associated with the Cordon Calle eruption, thanks to an effective evacuation plan. Long-term studies have indicated that the volcanic landscape of southern Chile was significantly altered by the 1960 events, with new geological formations and ecosystems emerging in the aftermath. The Great Chilean Earthquake of 1960 left an indelible mark on the world, reshaping our understanding of natural disasters and their far-reaching consequences. The quake left 2 million people homeless, killed approximately 1,655, and injured at least 3,000. The economic damage of the quake was $550 million, or more than $4.8 billion when adjusted for 2020 prices.